I've already done a review for probably my two favourite books that I read um, last month from my Italian literature themed reading month. Um, and then, of course, there were four more books on my TBR that I did also read and I was really glad to have read them. Um, and I thought, rather than doing some more um, smaller reviews of maybe like two at a time, I just do one sort of wrap up review of them um, because I'm going away tomorrow to Suffolk and I didn't want to have to kind of feel um, pressured to, <laughs> to make the videos in like a shorter amount of space to be able to get them up so I didn't have to do them when I was away. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk about them, I guess, from like the best down to the worst. They were all good. Um, they're all over three star reads. They were all decent reads that I did enjoy them all in different ways. Um, but there were some that I found it easier to read than others. So I'm going to start with... Um, I guess it was my third favourite after the first two that I've already reviewed, and that was um, Paolo Cognetti's The Eight Mountains. This book is a really gentle book, um, set in the Alps, um, mostly, and it's about a boy who his parents kind of bought a, almost like a holiday home, I guess, in one of the villages at the bottom of the Alps, and his father, who was very passionate about hiking the mountains, kind of would drag the sun up. Um, and then the sun also made friends with a boy who lived in the village. Um, and it kind of traces the relationship between the boy and his friend and the boy and his father, but then also his father and his friend's relationship as their kind of lives interweave. Um, there are lots of really poignant moments that kind of reflect on opportunities in life and the choice of sort of city living and wild living almost um, and a reflection on sort of the pressures that fatherhood can put on a relationship um, particularly in causing some jealousies between between um, uh, two friends. It was really beautifully written I found um, and I was the, probably the most apprehensive going into this one because Davide I know isn't most keen on this author and also Franny from Franny's Thoughts has um, she, she didn't enjoy this book so much. So then I was a bit like, oh, it's probably not going to be that good. But maybe it's just the translation that might have been better than the original text. I don't know. But I found that the writing style was quite sparse, but it was very evocative at the same time. It really captured the sense of being in the, in the mountains. Um, and you can really tell that the writer and the author is very passionate about the mountains. In some ways, it actually felt like um, a Japanese novel in that the sort of Japanese novel that I enjoy, um, you know, like The Forest of Wool and Steel. It's, it's very much focused on one specific hobby, I guess, and that is, in this case, like mountaineering um, and just the sort of like mount mountainous wildlife. Um, it is like that is probably as big a character in this book as, you know, the other characters that we meet. Um, and so the storyline that's happening around this thing is, isn't fast paced, isn't like heavily plotted, but it, it's quite slow and um, at times it's almost a little bit heavy as the words don't explicitly tell you something, but you are conveyed a feeling which kind of sits with you and makes you dwell on the thought. And I really, really enjoyed that side of it. Um, and I did, there were moments where, well, there was one particular moment where I actually had to like kind of put the book down and really like kind of mull on it and I felt almost like crying because it was just very poignant and maybe it's a subject matter that kind of um, touches my heart or something but it, it kind of delivered what I wanted from it and that was an interesting look at sort of the notion of masculinity of fatherhood of brotherhood of friendship that sort of thing it I think it did it in a really beautiful way and it wasn't just hyper masculine and it wasn't just one sided it it added like a sort of ambiguous sense to it which i really appreciated so i would actually recommend this to quite a few people and then of course i kind of my favorite after that one would be eleanor ferrante's my brilliant friend of course i don't really need to talk about what this one's about um and i did definitely enjoy it i think i gave it a four star read so it was a very solid read and it it could again have been read quite fast um because you're kind of drawn into it um Alex from What Page You Want talks about this series so much that he really loves these books, but he does say that this book in particular kind of just feels like a prelude, which you can just kind of binge read, get get over and done with before being thrust into like the true story, um, or like not the true story, but you know, like the real, the real hard stuff in the ne next coming books. And I can kind of sense that, and I can see what he means by that. 
Um, already I feel that I'm a bit apprehensive about continuing the series because I think once I finish the final book I will feel so bereft of like these characters because it, this book is so um, all-consuming within these characters' lives and th there's quite a big cast of characters and sometimes it's a little bit confusing about which one's which um, but most of the time you, you, you know them as if they're almost real and you're a part of their friendship group and I really appreciated that and it was such an enjoyable part of the, the story. Um, I think, interestingly enough actually, the in this book, the the main character who's kind of narrating the story, she, um, she and her friend, talk about literature in a way, um, and talk about specific books and things. And I, th oh, obviously, you can tell that these are the sort of books that Eleanor Ferrante herself, um, probably read and probably um, enjoys or is um, inspired by to some extent. And I think the feeling of this book, despite it being very. Neapolitan, despite it being having that sort of feel of Naples and it kind of truly encapsulating a space or a time or a, a collection of people, it does also have that feel of like a classic book that it it's written in a way that kind of classics are also kind of like written. I don't know how to explain it, but it just feels like a book that could last a long time and a book that um, lots of people can enjoy because it it has everything that you kind of expect from general fiction. So again, I did really enjoy it. I think I was partly expecting a little bit more from it, um, and I think the ending was a bit weak because I don't think this book can really stand by itself. It doesn't. It wouldn't. Doesn't make sense. And I think if you're going to write a book, especially the first book of a series, I think it has to stand in its own right also. And um, it didn't really have that, which was a bit disappointing, really, because now I just feel like I'm being forced into um, having to read the next one rather than, you know, wanting to. <laughs> um, and then the next book I read was a bit of an odd one. So I read um, The Revolution of the Moon by Andrea Camilleri. Now, this book I picked up straight away just because Miriam read it and loved it. Um, and she was like, you must read it. And then I did. And I did enjoy it. Um, <laughs> I will say that I don't think the translation of this book is actually all that good because I was speaking to Miriam about this and Miriam read the German version. So the translation in the German version has some differences to in the English version. In the English version, this all takes place in Sicily and then the the sort of the Duchess or the Marquess or whatever one who um, comes to this island and sort of rules it for these 27 days she is Spanish. Um, so then all of the people in this book are speaking Sicilian or the dialect or, you know, or, or a dialect, I'm assuming. Um, and then the, the Marquesa or the Duchess, whichever one she is, she is speaking partly Spanish and I think partly the dialect. It's really odd, but whatever the weather, the Spanish parts aren't translated. It doesn't have the Spanish and then like kind of give you like a sort of the English translation beside it. It's all just in Spanish and is you're kind of left there to figure it out for yourself. And I don't think that's very fair because it's not also like a simple Spanish that you can understand. It uses some verbs, um, some irregular verbs, which you kind of would learn in a basic Spanish class or would learn if you just go on holiday or something to Spain. It's, there's, so, there's some sentences which are quite complex and therefore you kind of miss out basically everything that she says if you don't know that. But also the fact that it's not everything she says is in Spanish. It'll be like half a sentence in Spanish and half a sentence in English. Or like it'll just be a word every now and then thrown in in Spanish and you're just like, it, it, it doesn't make sense then. Because you're like, well, is she speaking solely Spanish and do, do the other men understand her? Or... Is she speaking like the dialect but with a Spanish accent or is she saying mostly in dialect and sometimes in Spanish? It was really odd and I didn't I didn't get what was trying to happen it and it just felt like almost as if the translator um, perhaps just didn't know what the translations was but I would imagine that if he was strong enough in Italian to translate it he there you'd be able to at least have a 90% surety of what the Spanish would be. But I did love the book. I loved the concept of the book and I loved the story. I think the Marquesa was a really great character and it 
made me so angry. It like evoked such anger within me because the men were so conniving and so insidious in their plans. But um, I was like also cheering every time the, the Marquesa, the Duchess, whichever one she is, was beating them in her like, in her like special way. And I was like, yes. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that it's based off a true character on history where so little is known about her. Um, and I really enjoyed that side of it. It was just the Spanish which completely put it off. And finally, um, the last one at the bottom of my list, I guess, was Zeno's Conscience by Italo Sfero. Now, this book I feel a bit bad for putting at the bottom of my list. I still gave it 3.5 stars because I did like it. And I do appreciate this book quite a lot. But I do feel like I need to now spend a lot of time mulling over this book or reading other people's thoughts on this book because it's quite a chunker and there are parts of it that are really slow. It's basically a story that follows a man who at the start is trying to quit smoking and then he's writing a diary about him trying to quit smoking and all these other all these other events which have led him to a point where he had to see a psycho an analyst and um a psychoanalyst told him to write the journal in order to kind of figure out what was what was wrong with his psyche or something. I'm not entirely sure why this was put in place. But however, it's just this like sort of diary entry of him recounting uh, like a collection of years in his life. And it was really interesting. He's a very funny character. And there are some parts of the character that really remind me of myself in the fact that he he has this really very dramatic sense of things going wrong in his body and feeling like this is going to be his downfall, this is going to be his death. He never he always talks about never having health, and there are things like that which just kind of make me laugh because I I was like oh yes I I am um, I totally relate to that. But then there were points of it that really dragged because he would just talk about the same thing over and over again for quite a while and like in the middle of it it was just quite a long chunk of not really anything happening but not really also any development happening or like learning anything new but the weirdest thing was is that I, for the whole text i was like oh okay it's going to relate now to the psychoanalysis we're gonna we're gonna get to the end of it and realize it's all been a lie or it's all been a fabrication or what this all means or something and we, I guess in a way you were on the cusp of having that, but the final part of this book just took a really odd turn. It was then set during the First World War, and I felt like it was very poignant in what it was trying to say, but it was all related to the war, and that had nothing to do with about like the first 400 pages of the book, so you're kind of a bit like, what? what? <laughs> What's this got to do with everything that happened beforehand? So um, that's why I feel like I need to read somebody to like piece bits together for me so that I can um, so that I can be like, oh, okay, and then kind of make a more informed decision as to whether I think the author executed it well or not. Because for the moment, it, it, it was, it's just a, it was enjoyable because at points it did make me kind of chuckle and, you know, it, there was, the characters were entertaining and their lives were interesting to an extent, but yeah, did I understand it? Probably not. Who knows? Um, so they are the four books that I read, like the last four of my TBR. Um, I also picked up Arturo's Island by Elsa Morante because um, I wanted to read more female Italian writers and I put out on Twitter and my goodness, that's probably like the best response I've ever had on Twitter. Um, people were recommending female Italian authors that they've loved before, um, and it, it was really lovely to see like um, an Italian community coming to the, the aid of some um, little town Brit who was struggling to find female Italian writers in translation. So one of the ones that came up, and one of the ones I actually did not did already know about and was really excited for, was Arturo's Island. I've picked it up, um, I had hoped to finish it before the end of May, but actually it's taken me a lot longer than I thought. The first kind of maybe 50, 75 pages of this book um, were really beautiful and really rich. The language was stunning, it was evoking place, I was loving it. Um, but at the point that I am now, I'm about halfway or just after halfway of it, it's kind of got really heavy in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I am still really, really loving it, I'm still really enjoying it. But I'm kind of having to take a bit more time with it because we're getting a female writer who is writing a book about such detestable men and I feel like there's going to be something, some sort of revelation 
at the end. I have my theories, but um, the men of this book are horrendous. Like, they are vile and so abusive in a really, like, horrifically psychological way. Um, and I just find that a little bit heavy at the moment because you're reading also from a male's perspective and it's just so full on but also it's so powerful at the same time and so for that reason I'm just taking my time because when I'm reading it before bed I'm like oh god I can't oh I need to take a little bit of a breather from this um but you know I think that is a good sign that a, a writer is able to actually encapsulate that book because obviously it's purposeful it's obviously not just a man that's writing really badly, it's a purposeful decision to cast the characters in this light for a reason that I don't yet know and I'm excited to find out. Um, so hopefully I will finish this soon because then I can, you know, fully immerse myself in my surrealist literature. Anyway, they are the books. Um, a nice, hopefully, quick review slash wrap up. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping to do a vlog when I'm away in Suffolk, but we shall see if that happens. So look out for it if it does. Um, if it doesn't, sorry. <laughs> and I'll see you next time for another video. Bye bye.